Okay, so this is the video for lab four, absorption spectroscopy. Now this is a kind of a different lab than what you've been dealing with in lecture uh, the last few weeks, but it should be tying into what you see in lecture. At this point in lecture, you should be talking about concentration values. Um, I forget the unit number at the moment, but you should be talking about molarity, molality, mass fraction, and things like that. Um, so it should tie in to these values of concentration as well as really give you the first lab where graphing is important. So it ties into last week's lab as well. Now, what we're going to do is you're going to first learn the technique of absorption spectroscopy. This is something that is a learning outcome for the VCCS. So you have to be able to do this by the end of the semester. Um, it is also... Uh, just a really cool technique um, where you can have a solution that's got a color and determine what wavelength of photons are being absorbed. Um, and that's just really cool for, for real world applications. Now, you're going to find the maximum wavelength where a solution absorbs. Then using that maximum wavelength, you're going to come down and make a series of standards to absorb. Um, and once you have a calibration curve using their absorbances and concentrations, you're going to make a graph that, with a calibration curve and figure out the concentration of an unknown based on its absorbance. Now spectroscopy is really just a technique that um, takes advantage of the fact that you, we perceive colors when something is present. Um, to reflect and to absorb light. So for example, if you think about, let's go with red Kool-Aid. Now if we had Kool-Aid with a nice red tint, the reason we are seeing red is because when we talk about color, it's all based on what our eye sees. Eyelashes, Kind of a sad eye, but okay. Um, now, if we're seeing red, it's because all of the red light, or a lot of red light, is being reflected back. And once our eye gets interacts with those photons of light, we perceive it as red. Meanwhile, if you think about the color wheel, red, yellow, blue, if we're seeing red, all of this light is coming at us, the opposite between blue and yellow, which would be green, some green, some blue, some yellow, all the other colors are being absorbed by the sample. So these guys are being absorbed, the red is being reflected back, and you end up perceiving red light. Now generally it's going to be more like a couple wavelengths of red are being reflected, maybe a blue, because um, you can kind of imagine um, you know, you have, I mean, how many shades of red are there? You have um, pink red, you have more of the orange red, you have more purplish red. Um, there are definitely tones that would indicate there's a mixture of color here. So like, for example, um, maroon would have not only red, but a few shades of blue to kind of give it that purplish tint. Whereas, um, maybe an orange red has some yellow light mixed into it, okay? So it's not quite cut and dry like this, but it's close enough for our purposes. So using this, we can also uh, need, well actually we can do this first. We can also take advantage of the fact that you can perceive um, almost like a saturation. So for example, if uh, if you get sweet tea from a place that's got a really high sugar content, um, like Pollard's or uh, Chick-fil-A, um, that tea is going to taste incredibly sweet um, to the point where a lot of times people will um, dilute it with unsweet tea or water to make it less sweet. The same can be said here. Sometimes you have a solution that's only got a little bit of that color to it, um, 
and you will only see a little color, but you can make it more dense by adding more. Think about it in terms of like food coloring and icing. If you've ever made icing or seen like the different colors on a birthday cake, if you wanted it to be a, a light orange, you might add a drop or two of food coloring. If you wanted it to be really uh, darker, you could add four or five shades of drops of food coloring, and the shade is going to become instantly darker. And so you're going to perceive this as a more vibrant, more dense color. And that's what this is all about. Not only do we see colors based on wavelengths of, wavelengths of light, but we also see them based on the concentration or the amount of that substance in the sample. So let's go back here. Now a spectrophotometer is, a, is basically the more complex instrument than what we've just described. This actually pits everything into more of a quantitative um, analysis. So just like our light, our eyes see a sample and depending on the light that is reflected back, a spectrophotometer is going to do the same thing. So here, um, and this is going to be a super simple drawing guys, okay? You have a light bulb and you've got a sample. Now, there's two detectors here. Detect. Well, we're going to pretend I can spell right. Um, and so what you do is the spectrophotometer is going to um, take advantage of the fact that this sample is going to absorb and reflect light of specific colors. So, there we go. Um, the light for our spectrophotometer is going to be monochromatic. That means we only want to, to um, chromatic. We only want to test one wavelength at a time. And so maybe you're going to test uh, 510 nanometers. And then a minute later, you'll test 520 nanometers. We're only going to test those specific wavelengths. So you set the light bulb to emit a monochromatic light. Then you detect how strong this light is. The light then goes through the sample. And whatever light is reflected, well, some light will pass straight through. Some is going to be absorbed. But the difference comes out. And so you're going to be able to detect how much light is transmitted, how much of it made it all the way through, as opposed to the initial I0. Or you can kind of think about it in terms of absorbance, which is how much light actually stays in the sample, how much is absorbed here. And that's going to be um, this over this. Um, and you take the log of that. So generally, um, this is how the spectrophotometer works. You put light through, you get off a percent transmittance and a, uh, an absorbance. Now, the way that you test this each time is you are going to use a blank or something without the colored content each time. So you'll test this and you'll get a 100% transmittance or an absorbance of zero. And then you will then switch over to your sample. And honestly, guys, your spectrophotometers are amazing because you're going to be able to have three samples in there all at the same time. So it's going to really save you a lot of work from what we used to have. Now, we said that the more of that substance you have there, the stronger the color is going to appear. Well, the relationship is A is equal to uh, molar absorptivity times B times C. This is the absorbance. This is molar absorptivity. This is a constant for each different uh, component. B is your path length. And C is concentration. Now, because your path length, the size of your cuvette isn't going to change, and this guy isn't going to change, it really means that your absorbance is proportional to your concentration in a very real, very quantifiable way. Um, for the most part, um, 
the relationship here is going to be direct. It's going to be really nice. There is a limit to that. Um, you can kind of think about like if you had a bright light um, shining in your window and you put up blackout curtains. You know, it's going to block out some of the sun in the morning. Well, you could add a second layer of blackout curtains or a third layer of blackout curtains and so on and so on. But once there's no light, there's no light. You're gonna not. You're not gonna perceive a difference. And so, um, absorption and concentration are directly relation proportional for as long as the the sample can um, detect light. For you guys, um, if the absorption is greater than or equal to about 2.5, you're not gonna get a great calibration. And so, you want to make sure that your absorbance values are. Um, below that number for your uh, different parts of this experiment. Now, the other great thing about Beer's Law is, for example, in the um, pre-lab, we can tell you the, the two constants. And then we could either give you concentration and ask for absorbance, or we could give you the absorbance value and ask for concentration. Um, the idea is this is really what you're going to be doing later in the lab um, because when you set up your calibration curve, we tell you to do it absorbance versus concentration, and this is going to be in molarity. So here, if you go back and look at this, A equals epsilon times B times C. Calibration curve, the slope of a line is always Y equals MX plus B. Absorbance is your Y, concentration is your uh, X, and so this M is really epsilon times B. Um, and B for us, you're always going to have a path length of 1, so it's always 1. So it's really A equals epsilon times concentration. That's going to be this, the, the equation for your line. So you're going to have this great opportunity to set up your calibration curve and then find an unknown concentration by getting the absorbance. So you'll find the absorbance, maybe it's right here. You go over, point down, and look, here's your concentration value. Or you can plug it in here and solve for your C. So let's talk about what this is going to look like. And Part B, really, you, the whole point of Part B is to just become comfortable with uh, the spectrophotometer. And so you're going to have different wavelengths. I'm not going to do the whole thing. Let's just say we're going. I'm going to show between 500 and 600. And you're going to be doing it for several different metals. And so when you do um, copper solution, copper. Well, let's go all the way over. Pen. Interesting. Um, I'll do 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. Not proportional, but that's what it is. Now, 700 is really red light, and way down here is more um, blue and violet. And so, if you have a color solution that's blue, and copper is um, a nice blue color, um, you're going to get different wavelengths. So maybe over here you have, um, because we see blue, there should be really no absorbance values. And then occasionally maybe there's a little green, so you'll get a little bump. And then way over here at red light, you're going to start seeing a huge absorbance because um, if you're reflecting blue, you're absorbing uh, red orange okay so the idea is you're going to have a nice curve of absorbance versus wavelength for part b for copper then you'll do the same thing for a green uh, for nickel nickel is green and so same thing you might have absorbance um, uh, up here and nothing in the green region and then some more absorbance here and so you'll kind of see there's a trend here. Um, and then iron is red, or an orange, I guess, depending on 
which uh, solution we give you. So iron, because it's orange, should uh, reflect a lot at, in the orange region, and um, which is right here. But it may absorb more up here or something like that. And so you're going to get your absorbance values for each sample. So you'll have your cuvettes. And for each wavelength, you'll also have your blank. For each wavelength, you're going to set it to your blank, which is just the solution with no metal. You're going to set it to 100% transmittance to make sure your light is really intense. Switch it over to absorbance. And then you can change it over to your sample. So then you'll record it for copper. You'll move it over to, for the nickel and record it there. And then you'll move it over to the iron and get your values there. And little by little, you'll get this nice graph. Now, once you're comfortable with the spectrophotometer, we actually ask you to make some standards. And I think, oops, that's not what I meant to do. I think we give you 0.20 copper. Um, I forget if it's copper sulfate, copper nitrate, it really doesn't matter. Um, the idea is you want to have a way to systematically look at the absorbance versus concentration. So if you take 20%, 0.2 molar uh, copper too, and I think it tells you to take 10 mils, so this is your standard one, then you add 10 mils of water and mix this together. It's going to give you a new concentration. Now, guys, hopefully you remember all the way back, M1V1 is equal to M2V2. Molarity times the volume of the first solution equals the molarity times the volume of the second solution. You have the molarity and the volume of the first solution. 10 mils. We don't know the new molarity of standard 2, but we do know that we have a total of 10 plus 10 or 20 milliliters. And so when you set this up, 0.2 times 10 divided by 20, it's going to give you something like 0 0.10 molar. Um, you divide both sides by 20. So your standard 2 is 0 0.1 molar. And then you do the same thing. You take 10 mils of this plus 10 mils of water and you make standard 3. So here we have 0 0.1 molar, 10 milliliters, and now we're going to again end with 20 milliliters. And so you can find the concentration of standard 3. This times this divided by this should give you 0 0.050 molar. Watch your sig fix. And so on. Now the idea is once you know, oops, I skipped one. Hmm, I need another slide. Well, here, I'll just do it here. Once you know the concentrations, We'll go with 0, 0 0.5, 1 point, nope. Once you know the concentrations of your solutions, you can read their absorbance. So 0 0.05, 0 0.010, and then 0 0.2 over here. So you have those concentrations. Then you're going to plug in to the spectrophotometer, those four solutions. I think you have four standards. So you're going to read your blank, set it to 100% transmittance. Then you're going to come over to standard one. And you're going to get it in absorbance. You're going to do the same thing for standard two and for standard three. Now, as long as your absorbance value is less than or equal to 2.5 for standard one, you're good to go. If not, if it's higher than 2.5, get your instructor to come look at it. Um, you may just end up doing different dilutions instead. But the idea is for the standard 3 of 0.05, you're going to have some small absorbance. 
For standard uh, two, it's going to be higher, probably close to twice. And then it's going to go like this up again for standard one. And so you're going to get this nice calibration curve. Um, and really, it should hit the y-axis above zero, probably, or right at zero. And you're going to get a y equals mx line of best fit. Remember, y is your absorbance. X is your concentration. And so you have a nice calibration that tells you your epsilon. Epsilon is your slope. And molar absorptivity is your slope. So then you have an unknown vial. Your instructor will give this to you, or it'll be in your bin. You'll take this unknown, put it into your spectrophotometer, and read the absorbance. Then, say the absorbance is right here. You're going to come over, look at your line, go down, and find, oh, hey, look, it looks like it's about 0.12 molar. And then you can plug it into your equation just to kind of verify that. And so that is the whole point here. You're going to use the spectrophotometer to evaluate the line of maximum absorbance. Then you're going to use that maximum absorbance wavelength to make some standards, design a calibration curve, and find the concentration of an unknown. Now, there are tons of real-world applications for this, but I don't want to get into that here. Um, hopefully, you can talk about that to your, with your lab instructor during lab time. Um, keep.